welcome to Bake to the Future, the podcast where we take a forward-looking perspective on the baking industry. I'm your host, Jennifer Kohlfeldt, Vice President of Operations and Membership at the American Bakers Association. Joining me today are two special guests, Craig Purser, the President and CEO of the National Beer Wholesaler Association, and our very own Eric Dell, President and CEO of the American Bakers Association. It's a unique convergence of industries because as it turns out, both of our associations share a key ingredient and deliver products that Americans love, beer and bread. We also find ourselves on the front lines advocating for our members when it comes to agriculture and trade policies, navigating supply chain challenges and collaborating with the same retailers to bring our products to the market. So we thought it would be both enlightening and enjoyable to bring these two industry leaders together for today's discussion. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you, Jen. Great to be here. Craig, thank you. Thank you for being with us. We really appreciate it. And I know we've worked together for many years, so look forward to continuing that too. Well, and I, and I appreciate being able to join you guys. I mean, we've, we've talked about this before, but you know, what is beer at its essence? It's liquid bread. So I, I love the fact that you guys see the world we the way we do as it relates to all these many and varied challenges and opportunities that are out there. Yep. So before we dive in, we always start um, with a really fun tradition here on Bake to the Future. We always ask our guests about their favorite baked goods. But today, let's switch things up just a little bit and tell me what your favorite brew is. <laughs> I don't know if Craig can choose. Can you, Craig? <laughs> well, you can make it sort of generic so there aren't any favorites, right? I've got an answer, but it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm uh, as wishy-washy as a uh, politician on election day, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then what's your favorite baked good? Uh, At least we've Craig, got to know Craig, you want to go first or you want me to go? Favorite beer or favorite, favorite baked good? You do bake good and I'll do beer. Okay, so Ooh, baked I, think good. That's, that's I like that. So it's interesting because, you know, I, I, I am uh, not unlike my beer choices, which is really never the same beer in a row. I really do drink across the spectrum. I'll drink an IPA. I'll drink a light American lager, an import, uh, depending on the occasion. I'll even may go for a porter or a stout at the end of the night. But more importantly, when it comes to baked goods, I like the gamut of the sweet to the savory. And interestingly, if I had to pick right now, it is a soft pretzel. Oh, I like it. Maybe because it pairs so well with beer. (laughs) (laughs) Just maybe. That that might not be by chance, right? (laughs) So do you like it with the salt? Do you like the nice granular salt Salt, on there? Salt and mustard. Cheese is optional. Salt and mustard for sure. Nice. Love it. Uh, I'm with you. Um, So I would say on the beer side, a hazy IPA is my choice. Um, there we go. And then um, on the um, bake side, um, obviously sweet. Uh, on the sweet side would be donuts. And I think mm. folks have heard that before from me. So. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and all of that goes well with beer. I'll drink to that. Beer and donuts? Yeah. Hey. I kind of like it. Never try it. I might have to. You'll have to try it. Yeah. <laughs> oh. So, um, On other topics, thank you both for sharing. That was wonderful. Um, Both NBWA and ABA represent industries deeply intertwined with agriculture and commerce. So today we're privileged to have both of you here with us to shed light on their collective efforts to shape policy and navigate challenges in areas of shared interest, particularly when it comes to issues like workforce, transportation, and supply chain. So... In terms of workforce, I'd love to get your thoughts. Um, Labor shortages have been a concern across so many sectors. Can you discuss the workforce-related issues your associations are dealing with and any joint efforts to address those? Go ahead, Craig, if you want to start or if you want me to start either way. I know we've been working together. Uh, Craig and I have been working together with some other CEOs in the space and just really trying to find some solutions around workforce and workplace and and uh, for our members and for our industries, both in the manufacturing and the distributor side. Um, so uh, I will say that I appreciate Craig uh, working with us immediately when I came on board and reaching out. And uh, we've got a great working relationship. And I'll build a little bit on that, but I want to give Craig an opportunity to talk about what he's seeing in his space because it really is, it intertwines. Yeah. And, 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 you know, Eric knows this. I, I'm very passionate about the whole dynamic of 
I think people are the future of, of American business. And we're in a really unusual place in time where we have, I think, just a gigantic policy disconnect in as much as we have a worker shortage. We have hotels and restaurants that are unable to attract folks in the service economy. Um, we have restaurants that are closing because they don't have people to wash dishes. Um, we have a challenge in many, many marketplaces across our nation to find people to load beer trucks for 20 to $30 an hour. Um, you guys have similar challenges. We also have this situation where we have a whole host of folks that are in this country that are awaiting status to be employed. Notice I didn't say uh, we have an illegal immigrants that we can't put to work. We have millions of people that are in the system that are awaiting processing that are unemployable. And I think that's something that's got to change. It's um, I'm, I'm disheartened. We can talk about the farm bill bill that failed last night. Uh, but but big, bigger than that is some of the rhetoric of some of the policymakers as it relates to looking at some of the agricultural um allowances that have always allowed guest workers in this country that want to turn the clock back and make the situation even worse. So uh, I, I, I'm always a beer glasses half full person. I believe that there can be some sound policy that, that uh, where, where folks come together, but we must do something about this disconnect between 10 million people that are here legally, but are not employable. No, and I, I agree with you, Craig. And, and like I said, we've talked about this. And amazingly, I don't know what you've seen, Craig, but we've we've seen on both Republican and Democrat side recently um, finding more people who want to come together and solve this problem. But I think we have to get the larger business community to take a stand right. uh, and speak up. And I don't think I don't think they've done that enough in the past as as a, as a block and, yeah. and come together and really work together. Um, our board is really pushing for us to take a stand on this issue and find a solution because yeah. they want to employ these folks that you are describing uh, who are who are kind of lost in the system, right? Mm -hmm. um, in a system that's just not working. Well, uh, and, and what are they doing, Eric? They're working the underground economy. Some of them are, you know, and they're and they're sending money home, and they're doing the same things that new Americans have been doing for centuries, which is aspiring, you know, to eventually be citizens. I don't think we need to participate in the debate and discussion necessarily about citizenship. I'm right. talking about addressing the workforce shortage with the folks that are here, and. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I think what has existed for 100 years in the agricultural industry is something that perhaps service, manufacturing and distribution should seek to take advantage of. We don't need to get on, in on their on their actual policy, but it would be terrific if there were a way to harness some of these folks that are either not participating in the workforce, participating in the, in the illegal underground economy. Uh, but be able to get those folks to work so that more Americans can enjoy what what it is that they need to enjoy, which is more products, more services. Um, and, you know, we won't have to have that restaurant on the corner that lost their lease because they can't find three people to wash dishes. And it's also a food security issue. Uh, if we don't have enough folks to work in our manufacturing facilities, uh, there are people, as you know, who don't have access to food today. Um, and if we make that if we make the problem worse, we're going to have more people who don't even have access to food, which is a real problem. And, and you know, it's interesting because, um, you know, um, American Bakers during the pandemic was such a critical partner in leading the larger food industry uh, around, you know, s seems silly at the time, but really important at the time, you know, making certain that our folks were declared essential and making right. certain yep. that the supply chain was not disrupted as we all dealt with massive changes to our business. So I am optimistic that this is a problem that can be tackled because I do think there are plenty of organizations like ours and yours that can come together uh, to get some attention. But that does seem difficult today on the day, on the eve of uh, <laughs> government shutdown. I don't think it's a quick solution, but we can do some things that help, I think. Yeah, agreed. Absolutely.
And so I, I think the workforce challenges also lead into other issues as well. So I, I know transportation and supply chain are both hot topics for, for our industries. Um, I wonder if you could kind of share your thoughts on how, how both beer and bread have been impacted by that and, and what actions you're taking. Well, you know, one of the one of the things that uh, is top of mind when you talk about transportation policy that impacts both of us is the ongoing shortage of CDL drivers. I mean, you know, yeah. that has been something that predated the pandemic. We knew going into that, uh, I think the American Trucking Associations said we were between 50 and 60,000 drivers short. And when you look at the advent of, um, you know, the continued explosion of direct store delivery and the added dynamic of direct to consumer sales of products, you know, the Amazonification and the Walmart dynamic has, you know, has made this problem even more difficult. Um, so we're looking at a, kind of a combination of, of uh, policy changes, which includes two or three different legislative vehicles that are out there um, where we would actually get more drivers in the pool. One of those is the piece of legislation that would change the CDL driver's age from 21 to 18. That's a little bit dicey for alcohol, but we do know that a number of states already have that and they have guardrails in place. They have training requirements, all that makes sense. But one of the other things that we're doing in our space, and Eric, I'm interested if you guys are doing it, we're, we're, we're seeing a lot of people employ new best practices to work around this. Um, some of that includes how they treat their delivery drivers, uh, having them, um, you know, treating them kind of like the rock stars that they are, not having them uh, as exclusively involved in what we call hump and beer, which is, is actually placing it on the store shelves or getting it into the store, having merchandisers meet them there that are not CDL folks that are able to, to allow them to cover more ground. We're also looking at people uh, making modifications to their vehicle fleet um, so that they can uh, hit different targets depending on what the rules are in the, in the jurisdiction related to that commercial driver's license. It, it, those are great. I would say, Craig, I have seen the modification of, of uh, vehicle fleet discussion uh, being tossed around quite a bit in our industry. Um, interesting thought about merchandisers eat, uh, meeting your folks at the store. Um, to put things on the shelves. I haven't heard uh, the baking industry talk about that, uh, but that's a very interesting dynamic because it takes those hours uh, because I'm assuming uh, they're, they're taking hours that's being clocked as driving hours while they're stocking the shelves. And it, it, it just, it doesn't work well for those drivers. I mean, the it's, you, you know, you, you know, this, the economics of distribution are fleet fuel and warehouse and how you manage that against a backdrop of increased fuel co costs shortage of CDL drivers, you know, and, and um, kind of a marketplace of, of doing more with less, I think is going to be part of this. And I do think as associations, while we're advocates first, um, you know, we, we have been talking about CDL shortage, frankly, since for, for nearly 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of this is, it goes to educational dynamics. It goes to incentives way bigger than just what's in front of us. Um, but I do think we've got to, you know, you, if you want to make an omelet, you got to break some eggs. Yeah, yeah, and you're right. And one of the things on the that I remember has been tossed around for a while is uh, in the National Guard, you know, taking folks in the National Guard or in our military who might be under 21, allowing them to drive uh, as a side job, right? And we've, we've seen things. great strides made with that as far as shortening training periods and um, getting some of those folks. In, injected into our workforce. Our industry, uh, we feel like we've got a really good track record. A lot of our owners and operators, you know, are former military or members of their family have served. So there, is, and there's a, you know, just like your businesses, there's kind of a, an esprit de, de corps uh, that people aspire to and they want to belong to something. They want to participate in a business that's competitive and that's fun. And, um, you know, the ways that we can make some of those changes and modification is really important. You know, also, Eric, and, I, and you and I've talked about this, um, never been more important to uh, have companies, owners, operators, leaders thinking about employee recruitment, but also employee retention. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if, if, if we really do agree that, that uh, and, I, and I feel strongly this way, I think people are going to be the currency of the future. 
and being able to attract and retain a good workforce has never been more important. So we're watching people make big, in, in, and I say investments, it's not necessarily dollars, but share of mind investments in building a better culture. Um, I, we're, I, I agree we're, 100%. We're seeing great success with that. I'm curious if you guys are doing the same thing. Yeah, so we're, we're to your point about retention, the, the discussion, and we've been going through our strategic planning, the discussion has moved from recruitment because they feel like it has moved to retention. I don't know about your space, but we feel like we can find the unskilled or the skilled. They're getting enough resumes now, whereas the problem during and, and right after the pandemic was they couldn't get the resumes. Right. Now they're getting a lot of resumes, too many. Yeah, <laughs> and sometimes, um, but it's retaining those good employees and trying to keep them in place because it's so competitive out in the marketplace. Uh, yeah, that, and I, to I, your I, point, it's not always money, especially no. with the next generations. Um, you know, it really is. They value time with family. They value uh, having a balance in the culture, if I could say it that way. Um, of of you said fun and 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 value and fun and and work, but. It really is having that fun and that time with their families uh, where they have the flexibility. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that both of our organizations have invested in as it relates to kind of that, um, what I would say is professional development is in, in our next generation programs. Um, I, I, uh, we, this will be our 16th year for our next generation leadership conference which um, has been like a shot in the arm as it relates to engagement for the association. And particularly for multi-generational business, it's allowed a number of uh, emerging leaders to get recognized. I was fortunate enough probably eight or 10 years ago to come and speak at a leadership conference that you guys hosted as a guest. And it blew me away because I was able to share some of the things that we were doing but also to hear from some of your first generation or your next generation leaders firsthand. And it really, really uh, worked well. Um, we were able to, you know, there are no original ideas in this business. We just steal things from each other. <laughs> uh, but, I, but I do believe that getting those emerging leaders involved that have some of those values that maybe aren't, uh, you know, what their, their fathers and grandfathers might have had. And, you know, one of the, the other things that we've been able to do more recently is the Brew Organization is uh, building relationships and empowering women. And I, that is especially important not to meet a metric or meet somebody's preconceived idea of, of, of diversity, not that there's anything wrong with that, but really to up our game as it relates to that employee retention as an industry. Um you know, statistics, whether it's uh, Boston Consulting Group or whether it's McKinsey, more diverse leadership teams are more successful. Having more women around the table absolutely impacts your culture and goes to speaking to some of those things that emerging leaders and emerging employees value. And so this thing has been gangbusters. Ours has got a nice little beer industry acronym called BREW. Uh, building relationships and empowering women. And it has just been gangbusters, wildly, wildly successful. We're going to have an Alliance for Women in Beer event uh, in conjunction with our convention in two weeks. And we've got over 300 leaders signed up. Wow, that's wonderful. And and you mentioned the Next Generation Leadership. We, our program, Next Gen Baker, as you referenced, and it's just been so powerful and so helpful. And we, we actually hosted it uh, recently this pa or this week um, ha and had a speaker on really updating your culture, just like you said, Craig, mm -hmm. not just trying to hit metrics that someone may set uh, for for some reason for metrics. But it's it's more about you will hit those metrics if you change your culture to yeah. get your culture right. Um, and, and I gave an example of something I'd heard recently of a, of a gentleman in, from Louisville, Kentucky, who had told me his son has over 40 different languages spoken at his, um, his elementary school, 40 in Louisville, Kentucky, because Catholic um, Charities has moved a lot of uh, folks in from around the world into that area. Well, think about that, what that is doing to our future workforce. And, it, and, and what it's doing is it, it, it's 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 a positive. It is going to make companies that are that are that are looking more like their marketplace be more successful. I mm -hmm. couldn't be 
I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, what I will say, and I'll build on this, Craig, is it, it might be interesting um, if we could take the opportunity in the near future to bring our next generation leaders together um, in, in some form of an event. Uh, I don't know when your fly-in is and when our fly, our fly-in is we're doing in November, but it would be interesting if we could find a time and place. It doesn't even have to be Washington, D.C. Sure. Because we have so many family-owned businesses. We talked about this yeah. earlier and talked about it before, but yeah. um, that have the same type of challenges and the same type of leadership changes going on within those businesses. So I think it would be a great opportunity for us to bring those groups together uh, so that we could work together um, and, and learn from each other. Because as yeah. you said, there's nothing new. You just learn from others. <laughs> it's so interesting because our program started out probably in the earliest years, it was probably uh, 75, 25 family members mm-hmm. who hired professionals. And that, that number has modulated to where it's close to 50, 50. And so mm-hmm. we'll do some programming that's about, um, you know, that's more ownership oriented. That's more about family planning, more about next generation and succession, things of that nature. But we will match that with ongoing professional development that applies to everybody. So uh, I love that. Excuse me. I love the idea of collaborating and doing more and more together. One of the things we did um, before I was at ABA, um, General McChrystal, Stanley McChrystal, has a leadership program in this area. I don't know if your your um, next generation has gone through that, but I think ours did, if I'm not mistaken, Jen, well, General, uh, through that program. General McChrystal has spoken at our convention not once okay. but twice. He spoke <laughs> to us at our 75th annual convention 11 years ago, and then we had him uh, as we did a virtual convention during the pandemic. Oh, Both yeah. times he was just lights out. And I think um, when you can identify somebody like that and glob on to what they're doing, um, you know, it's terrific. Um, uh, Stan's kind of become a friend as it relates to to this, and he's a friend to many in the association community. But it's it is so amazing if you get into fully understanding what he learned from you know all that time in the military. I remember from from his book, um, he he talks about the difficulty that they had in the ground in Afghanistan and working and and being able to get the people that they were trying to help to trust them. And what he covers very early in the book is he talks about until we were really serious about getting meeting their ordinary le- needs, which included clean water, things we can't even imagine, right. you know, food, safety, security. You know, we could say we're from the United States and we're here to help. And it was falling on deaf ears because you're here and you're making my life hell. Yeah. Meeting those basic needs, just like our businesses, really. Of our employees. Absolutely. So we're getting close to the end of time, believe it or not. Um, I wanted to ask one final question and sort of taking all of the dynamics at play that we've been talking about. Um, As leaders of your respective associations, what are your visions for the future of the baking and brewing industries? What do you see? Do you have a, you know, a crystal ball? What do you see happening there? (laughs) Go ahead, Greg, and I'll, I'll wrap us up after. Our our, uh, our industry is going through a tremendous amount of change. Um, I, I, I have had the opportunity to lead my group for over 15 years, and it was about 15 years ago when I said something that um, I don't think I, I don't think any of us realized would would come to fruition the way that it has. I I said in an annual meeting speech, I said, "Are we on the cusp of of transforming?" That was a big word 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. Transforming from being uh, brand dependent beer wholesalers to that of becoming independent brand building distribution companies. And that mm-hmm. is a thousand percent come true. And uh, to the point where we're watching our members expand uh, beyond beer, uh, tremendous amount of growth in non alcohol products, um, mm-hmm. canned cocktails, um, you know, seltzers. Jennifer weren't even a product a dozen years ago. Um, yeah, we could have yeah. imagined that we would have a flavored water that provides liquid freshment with a low level of alcohol in it that would transition and change the, you know, change, change people's lives. So there's all this diversity of beverage. And th- so, so I think the 
change is the constant and that is going to continue. Um, you know, like I said, I'm a beer glasses half full person. I agree. I believe that our best days are in front of us, but you know, we've, we've got a very tough dynamic that's ongoing right now. We had a major brand challenge this summer that continues to impact a number of our members. Um, not the kind of industry that you want. I mean, not the kind of publicity that you want for your industry when there is just a whole lot of acrimony and anger of people. Yeah. I mean, it's just beer, man. It's just beer. <laughs> and I don't care who you are. All the things we're fun. trying to do is sell another case of beer. <laughs> so, you know, that's that's an interesting dynamic. But, right. um, you know, what can and should the association be doing to expand that playing field, to, to meet the needs of more thirsty consumers? What can and should we be doing to help our member companies evolve and transition into whatever's next? So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the the future's bright, but we got a lot of a lot of work ahead of us, and that's why they call it work. Absolutely, exactly. I agree. And uh, Craig, you and I think a lot alike. So, being on the front foot, glass half full, right? Uh, thinking about the future. Um, really, since I've come in, we've been working on um, our planning for the future, mm -hmm. and it. I believe the industry, the food and beverage industry in general, in the past, and and we've gotten away from it. Um, in the past few years, I think we're doing better, but I think we've we've been more on the defensive side uh, for many years. And I just you begin looking like the big bag food and beverage industry, right? Um, you can't just say no to everything. Um, you have to work together. When the government comes and has has some sort of regulation that they've proposed, find a way to try to meet halfway, or if if it makes sense. Sometimes you have to fight things. Absolutely, you can't always fight things. So I guess the thing that I've been working on is trying to put us in the best light uh, and and frame us in the best way possible because we are doing a lot of good things. We have a lot of family owned businesses. It's hard work, baking and beer. I mean, it's it's hard work. It's not just sitting behind a desk and 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 answering the phone. It's really being out there with with people, uh, and and it's hard really hard work on our side, on the manufacturing side and your side on the distributing side. Uh, the other thing I would say is we're really I'm trying to push to be aspirational in terms of things that matter um, to our either our customers or our end consumers. We've got folks pushing us in the areas of sustainability and those kind of spaces. And, you know, it's the right thing to do, not only for business, but also for the world. And you can do both. You can do both at the same time. So uh, the one thing I've learned about our industry, I will say in nine months, is they've been doing a lot more than I thought. We're just not telling the story. And I'm sure you have, you probably have challenges with that too. So one of the things that, that I'm pushing for is compiling that information of everything we do. And your folks are great about this, Greg, giving back to the, their communities. Uh, low country of South Carolina, where I was from, your folks down there, just give back so much to the community. Uh, in different ways, not just money, but time and talent and so forth. And um, so I think we're going to be what you're going to see and what I'm pushing on is let's tell our story because we're doing a lot of good things for America yeah. <laughs> and it, all across America and for our, for our customers and for the country. So um, a lot of aspirational future focus uh, on workforce challenges that we've been talking about in other transportation, a lot of the political challenges, too. Yeah. Well, Amen, I'm brother. I'll tell you what, you, you summed it up <laughs> nice. That's great. I cannot thank you guys enough for letting me crash your party. Uh, thank today. you. Absolutely. And, you know, we so appreciated it. I mean, Jennifer, obviously this is a, a great tool and a great way to communicate directly with your members. Um, you know, Eric, we've had an opportunity to work together for 20 plus years. Exactly. Obviously your time on the Hill and more recently uh, uh, at NEMA, we were, you know, there, there's just a whole bunch of, of, um, good work that we've done together. Yeah. And you know, and I appreciate the friendship personal and, and all the guidance you've given me over the last couple of months has been very helpful too. Absolutely. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much for thank sharing you. your time and your insights and expertise. And I know our listeners will really appreciate that. Um, and also for our listeners, we hope you enjoyed today's conversation and we also value your feedback. So let us know what you thought of the show by emailing hello at AmericanBakers.org. And don't forget to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it's Apple, Google, Spotify, Amazon Music, or Ghana. And thank you for tuning in. 